this message is real in my heart. I have not preached it in years. For some reason, I threw it in my briefcase. And that's just how I do. And I want to go to Judges chapter 5. You, you uh, technical guys who do such an amazing job, don't freak out. I didn't send this outline. We'll ad lib it. Judges chapter 5. And I want to begin reading in Judges chapter 5 with verse 2. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll call for you in just a few minutes. Judges chapter 5 and verse 2. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Again in verse 9. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. For the sake of time, I'm going to jump and skip around. In verse 4, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched through the field of Edom, God is on the move. God is going to battle. The earth trembled. The heavens poured. The clouds poured water. The mountains gushed, or or the King James says, bowed down before the Lord. I'll explain that in just a moment. Verse 8, until Deborah arose, a mother in Israel. Just going to highlight some things and then I'll go quick. Verse 20, they fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, galloping, galloping of his steeds. Verse 23, curse me, Rose said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, listen, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to help the Lord against His enemies. And blessed among women, one last illustration he gives, is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. And it goes on to tell how she took a, a... kitchen utensil and killed the most powerful general in the army that was coming against God's people. A housewife got involved. I want you tonight to go with me and look at this story because when we look at the headlines, when we look at the news, I watched it last night and I've watched all day. I preached in Kiev Ukraine five times in that city, that that major city. I preached in the largest auditorium in that city for a conference of an amazing pastor there that is on my heart tonight. As Russia has invaded the Ukraine, it is very evident if you don't know that something major is going on. I'm not somebody who cries wolf all the time prophetically. But this, this, this is a big deal that's going on. The world is on edge because the Russian bear has come out of hibernation. Just like the Bible said it would in the book of Ezekiel. I listened last night to a uh, world leader who did an interview who was very familiar with the military and worked in previous administrations in defense. And he said, it's never, ever a good idea to push away. He said, I was taught this from a a young person all the way up to an old man that he is now. And he said, never do you want to push your biggest enemies, and he named them concerning America, Russia, China, 
and I ran together in a pack. And he said, that is exactly what is happening in the world today. And boy, when he said that, something went off in my soul and in my spirit that Russia is on the move. And President Putin said today in a press conference that his desire was to take back the greatness of the nation and the Russian Empire, the nation of Russia, and, the, and, and particularly the Russian Empire. Which means to me, unless I'm mishearing something, he's probably not going to stop in the Ukraine. But what's amazing is this, 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 this coming together of Russia is on the move. China, this is not a, 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 in any way a word against the, the, the populations of the precious people. Again, I preached in Moscow. I preached in Russia. I, there are precious, precious believers there. It's a spirit that's over these leaders. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's very real. And what we've been through has prepared the way. The last two years, everything that has happened, we are seeing the very fulfillment of prophecy. You can, you can read prophecy in the New York Times every day. And what amazed me was, I was thinking about it just today, and I was talking with Brian Woodson from my church. He came down with me tonight, and... And I said, you know, the thought hit me, China, Russia, and Iran. China is responsible for releasing the virus that changed the world, changed an election, changed everything. And then Russia, Russia now is on the move. And then you have Iran who... They are very close. They're very close. And Iran is about to get in a... I'm not being political at all. I'm not here to do that. I'm just asking you to see the signs of the times. Because when Iran has money, they're going to use it for one thing, terrorism. And they're going to use it for another thing to ultimately go against the nation of Israel. And this move of Russia and this move now, I believe China is watching closely. And I'm praying we don't get in a war. I don't want our soldiers to die nowhere. I don't want us to get involved in it. And I'm sure you don't either. We're all praying. But could it be, could it be that China, Russia, Iran, the spirits behind them, ultimately, you know your Bible says in Ezekiel 37, those specific three nations out of all the nations of the world, are the ones on the main stage that will ultimately invade Israel and come to fight with the armies of the Antichrist in the battle of Armageddon. And Russia's on the move, and China's on the move, and soon Iran in the Middle East. Mark what I'm telling you, not that I'm some kind of prophet, and I'm certainly not a prophecy guy. But I do believe in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say something big right now. I do not believe the church is a bunch of victims. The end times are not happening to the people of God. If I read this book, the people of God are happening to the end times. And what was, and what was taking place in this story that I read out of the Bible in Judges chapter 5 is God is going to war. God is on the move in the earth. God is dealing with his enemies. And the Bible begins to lay out things that happen when God declares war and there is a move of God that is being released across the world. The people, the first thing it says is the people of God willingly offered themselves to get in the fight. Turn to somebody and say, it's time to get in the fight. 
they willingly offered themselves. But not just the people, not just the people of God. They can't be neutral. The ministries can't be neutral. The churches can't be neutral. We've got to get in the fight for souls, for the kingdom, for the preaching of the gospel. We've got to get in the fight for our cities, for our nation, for our world. We've got to get in the fight. Not play church, get in the fight. Verse 4, he said, the earth trembled. When God is going to war and going out to fight in, in, in war, the Bible said the earth started shaking. I mean, the Sisera and all his 600 chariots of iron are rumbling and coming across the valley to, to fight against Israel. And God says, I'm going to war. I'm going to fight them. I'm not backing up. It's time for a victory. And all of a sudden, the people of God offered themselves willingly to get in. They didn't have to be begged. They didn't have to be followed up on. They didn't have to be asked, where are you? You know, COVID is almost over and you still hadn't come back to church. Are you ever coming back to church? The people willingly, <laughs> you better give me a big amen on that, pastors. I mean, I appreciate online, but online, I hope God doesn't send you a video of heaven when you die. I don't think it's the same thing. I don't think it's the same thing. I could be wrong. Maybe 3D or something is going to make up. But... But this is, but the earth, the earth started. If God's going to war, the earth said, let me. Y'all hear me okay? And then the next thing the Bible said, that the earth trembled. Then it said the clouds dropped or the heavens will drop. Or, so you got the earth trembling and you got the water or the clouds. They start fighting. They say, well, if God's going to war, we, got, we can't be sitting on the sideline. We can't be watching YouTube. We can't be watching Netflix for 14 hours and not volunteering in the church anymore. We, 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 got, we, got to get, we got to get in this battle. And so you got the earth shaking and then the clouds drop, which causes a fog. It's a foggy situation, and then the rain drops, which causes mud puddles for 600 chariots of iron. The earth is shaking. Now the, 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 the chariots of iron are getting stuck in the mud. Then the next verse says, the mountains laid low, which means when the enemies start running from those chariots, the mountain said, my God who created me, the God who, who says the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool, he's going to war. He's concerned about the times we're in. He's ready to win some victories on planet earth. And, and the mountain said, I know I'm high, but I'm going to bow low so that when they try to hide, they won't be able to hide under me because I'm going I'm to go down. So you got the earth shaking, the mountains are high, saying, you're not getting behind me and hiding. And the clouds are dropping and messing them up and putting mud puddles all out in the valley. Verse 12, Deborah, I mean, you can't get any men to leave. So Deborah... Deborah, she, she said, I, I ain't got much, but I got a song, and I'm going to get up, and I, I'm going to, uh, Casey is going to grab a microphone, and she's going to use her talent because God is on the move, and I may can't be like somebody else, and may can't do what somebody else can do, may can't give what somebody else can give, but I got to willingly give myself and get in this, and my gift to the battle is my song. And then the kings fight. The Bible said in verse 19, the kings fought because their God is in a battle. And then it says the stars fight from heaven. The stars. 
Twinkle, twinkle, little star. The star saw, oh my God, the earth shaking, the clouds in it. Look out. I mean, the, 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 the mud puddles, God, God's using that. God's using all the mountains are bowing low. And then the mountain, the stars start saying, well, if our God's going to battle, we got to get involved. And so, you know, stars are how they traveled. They traveled by stars. Uh, remember the wise men? You ever heard that story? They follow the star. Well, it's, it's a fixed point of reference. But the star said, we're going to mess them up. And, and, we, and we'll just, we'll move over a few degrees if we need to and just really do our thing, our part in this battle. We'll mess them up. The stars, then it says the river, verse 21, the river said, the river starts saying, well, if God's going to battle and the mountains and these clouds and everything else are fighting, the river says, I want to get in on this. Throw some of them in here. I'll drown them. Just throw them in here. I'll use my thing. I'll drown them. Read it. And the Bible said that the river started swallowing, swelling its banks and swallowing people up, the enemy. Then verse, the, the, the next verse said, the horses, the, even the horses, the horses said, give me one of them, give me one of those Syrians and let me just stomp him. And the Bible said the horses started, it wasn't just the people, the people God fighting, the horses got in on it. Kicking one one way and stomping on people and Isn't that amazing? Everything's involved. Everybody's involved in the battle. I'll tell you this. Something miraculous and, and stunning happens in verse 23. An angel comes down in the middle of all of it. Read the story. And he says, I've been watching. I've been taking note. The leaders are leading they're willingly giving themselves, but there are no people that are jumping in the battle like they ought to be. The mountains are fighting. The earth is shaking. The clouds are pouring rain. It's all happening. The river's overflowing and drowning the enemy and fighting. Everything is seen that God is doing something in the earth and they're willingly giving their, their gift, their talent. Deborah's singing. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And he noticed how many were inactive and sitting around doing nothing. And he pronounced a curse on that people. And he said, I curse you me rose and the Bible said he cursed them bitterly and then he gives the reason why because they came not to the help of the Lord in the time of battle while the river's moving and the horse is stomping and the clouds are pouring and the heavens are dripping and the earth is shaking and the woman is singing and the other housewife is using a utensil to drive a, a, a stake through the king, through the, through the general Sisera's brain in her tent. She used milk. She used her cooking ability to get him to eat and drink and go to sleep and put a stake through his brain. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read the Bible. I don't have time to explain everything to you. You're supposed to give a little bit and you know the story. And if you don't know the story, you don't know the Bible enough. Anyhow, keep moving. The tribe of Meros. The Bible said, the angel said, I curse you bitterly. Because in the time that God needed you the most, you sat on the sideline with your hands in your pockets. And the angel saw the inactivity and cursed them bitterly. God was in the battle and you didn't come to help the Lord against his enemies. Heaven, I believe, in this hour has declared war on demonism, on carnality, on sin, on sorrow, on condemnation, on fear, on depression, on opioids, on, 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 on hatred. It's declared war on the power of the enemy 
All hands need to be on deck. Enlist, involve, invest, get in the fight. No one must stand by with their hands in their pockets when you see there's no way you can be living the last two years that we've gone through and now going into the third year, there is no way you can just think these are just normal times, same old, same old. If you have anything in you, it's going off saying, these are signs of the times. They're all around us. It's a trial run on 666. Matthew chapter 12 put it this way. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. Listen to these words. And he that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. You either get in and start gathering with me. God says, I'm not as nice as all the preachers nowadays. I'm saying you're with me, you're in or you're out. It's time to get in or get out or get run over. God says, I will no longer allow you. I don't want a curse on my life. Do you? I don't want a bitter curse. Is this too hard? I had another sweet message, but no neutrality, no middle ground. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Woo. It's time for the church to be the church. It's time for the church that when the bell rings, we come running and we have on the whole armor of God and we realize that these are days when we must be serious about the Father's business. Our greatest battle is not sin. Our greatest battle is not Satan. Our greatest battle is not the society. Our greatest battle is boredom. Masses of people profess Christ only. But the question is being asked, who's on the Lord's side? Rise to your feet if you're on. The, I'm not saying you have to do it now, but it's time to get up and stand up because God is going to battle. We will suffer a curse, I believe. We will suffer a curse if we sit back in times like these and are inactive and we know the truth, all you have to do to go to hell is nothing. Whew. That's a little strong, isn't it? <laughs> Matthew 25, I'll proof text it. Matthew chapter 25, the servant was given two talents. One was given five, one was given ten, and they doubled it and doubled it and used what they had, and God blessed them and multiplied them. But one was given two talents, and the Bible said he did nothing with it. And the Bible definition of wickedness is when God gives you something, and it doesn't matter if it's as great as the guy who's got ten talents. The Bible definition of wickedness is not getting high, getting drunk, and committing fornication, although that is wicked. God says the wicked definition for some of my children is when I give them talents and they do nothing. The Bible said that the one who was given two talents was called, listen to the wording, Matthew 25, you wicked, slothful, slothful, unprofitable servant. Not because he did not have ten talents or five talents, but because he had two talents and he did absolutely nothing with them. When God was going to war. Don't tell me that God didn't have something in mind when he saved you. When he filled you with the Holy Spirit. When he baptized you in his fire. When he washed you in his blood. He said there's something you can do. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a singer. You don't have to have this, that, or the other. But there's something that you can do. And because he did nothing with what he was given, 
the Bible called him a wicked, unprofitable person. There's a gift, there's a talent, there's an ability that God has given you. The unemployment rate in the church is out of control. Hanging outside of every church is an invisible sign after COVID. Help wanted, apply inside. Let me put it another way. Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous. But the laborers, not the sitters, not the people watching online in their PJs. I'm not against that. I can't be against it. That's my biggest congregation now. <laughs> and my biggest giving. But at some point, I want to preach them off a camera and into a seat and out of the seat, into the aisle, and out of the aisle and out of the altar, into the harvest. The harvest. Somebody shout the harvest. The laborers are few. And God's going to war. God's serious about saving families and saving marriages and saving young people that are so lost. They've lost everything and they need somebody to reach them. Turn to somebody and say, we need your help. The leaders said they willingly gave themselves. The leaders are ready. The pastor's ready to launch other campuses. The people are ready. The leaders are ready to come back. We need the people to willingly offer themselves. I want to tell you what we need. We need preachers. We need worship leaders. Thank God for these singers and all these people. You know how long it takes to get, they make it look easy. You know how long these people rehearsed and how many special things. You know how long it takes to get all that graphic stuff. That's people doing their thing. We need preachers. We need worship leaders. We need prayer warriors. Well, I'm in retirement. Well, if you're not working... <laughs> Why are you not praying? Why are you not leading the prayer chain? Why don't you have a Sunday school room somewhere if we got any more left? Tony, you know about that. <laughs> and here's what's going to mess you up. <laughs> Y'all don't want to hear this part of the sermon. It's time to offer God your gift free of charge. <laughs> We need preachers, we need worship leaders, we need ushers, we need parking attendants, we need prayer warriors, we need, and I wrote this one down, I like it. We need some people to get rich and bless the church. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say, one of your major assignments in the kingdom, just tell them, is to, is to go work, get a job, go work, get rich, and bless the church. Now somebody shout. Oh, don't act like that's not spiritual. Somebody shout. Quit telling your people that going to work is not spiritual. You know what the Bible said in Matthew chapter 20? Verse 6, why stand you here all day idle? The next verse gives the answer. Because no man has hired us. <laughs> Isn't that classic? Isn't that good? Wow. I'm not saying that people ought not to be paid and all that. I'm not, we, we pay a lot of people. I'm just saying it starts out as a servant. <laughs> because no man has hired us. Well, I got, I got a word for you. God has come to hire you. 
Mark chapter 14 and verse 8, the woman with Mary with, broke the alabaster box of expensive ointment. And this is, this, is the, this is what Jesus said when he saw her break open the alabaster box of worship and pour it on his feet. The Bible said that Jesus made this comment because she has done what she could. Wherever the gospel is preached, this woman is to be remembered as a memorial of someone who did not. I never asked her to do what she could not do, was not able, not gifted, not talented to do. I only ask her to do what she could do. And because she's done what she could do. It, she'll be remembered as a memorial forever, wherever the gospel is preached. Wow. That means whatever God gave you to do, whether shaking a hand or it's making a phone call or it's driving a bus or whatever it is, if everybody would start doing what they can do, do what you can and God will do what you can't. <laughs> It's probably wrong English, but it's just how it is. <laughs> Naaman refused to get in the Jordan River and dip because it was not big enough, pretty enough, flashy enough. He wanted to go to the fancy river down the road where he'd get a lot of attention. And that servant spoke up and gave him a lesson on the, from the school of the miraculous. When he said, if he had asked you to do something big, you would have done it. But you were too big to do little things, therefore you're too little for God to do any big things in your life. And when he dipped seven times in the Jordan River, seven ducks in a pond, And we shot them all. <laughs> Don't we? we shot them all. Too many resist involvement with the small. Too many resist involvement with the small. Start where you are. I'm glad I didn't wait till the church got big to get involved in it. But start where you are. If we love the people that nobody wants, God will send us the people that everybody wants. If you'll love the people, if you'll cherish them and honor them and treat them with dignity, if you'll go after the people that nobody wants, God will start sending you the people that everybody wants. I'm almost done. Can I preach a few more minutes? You know, if, if you're one of those people who says, Pastor, I'm so upset with you. I've been out for four weeks and you haven't even called me. I have a response to that. People don't need to tell me that. My response is, that's on you. Apparently, you were doing nothing that made anybody even notice. It didn't make a difference if you were there or not. I know at least you would have showed up on the tithing list, and, and you, you didn't even show up on that. You ain't volunteering in no other ministry. I'm, I'm being too real and honest <laughs> with this group. Y'all about to, y'all looking at me partly cloudy right now. You, you, you need, if you can lay out a church for four weeks and nobody not even know it, something's wrong with you. You ought to be so involved that if you're not there, they're saying, what are we going to do? We're so used to them doing this and that and this and that and this and that. Ha, <laughs> 
That's a funny point. <laughs> you really get to give in good, miss one service, and everybody will know it. <laughs> the youth pastor will come to your house. I better end this. <laughs> I want to give a different altar call tonight. I don't want in these days of amazing prophetic importance. It's so obvious. I don't know exactly what God's doing, but I sense, I know, I feel it in my church, in my pulpit. Something has kicked in in 2022. A momentum is, is building in 2022. Prayer is becoming a major, major force in our ministry. And it's just powerful and it's almost effortless to get up and preach because the anointing is so strong. And I know God is on the move and I don't want to be bitterly cursed by an angel that says, you whom the ends of the world have come upon us. That's a scripture right out of your Bible in the New Testament. And I don't want to be sitting on the sideline with my hands in my pockets, living in yesterday, talking about the good old days. I still believe in the last days, saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters. It's coming. It's coming. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. It's coming. It's coming to our homes. It's coming to our families. It's coming to our ministries. It's coming to our churches. It's coming. And the people who will be blessed will be the ones who will, will offer themselves willingly, passionately, enthusiastically. Shout, I want to be used by God. Shout, God, here's my talent. Here's my gift. Here's my personality. Here's what I bring to the table. I want to be used in these days. I see that you're up to something in the earth. And if the earth can shake and the clouds can drop and the mountains can bow and the horses can pull and all the things that you created can see what you're doing. Wake us up, Lord. To get back involved, back committed to the vision to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. His name is Jesus Christ. And when you do, He'll go with you. He'll bless you. He'll increase you. He'll blow your mind. I close with this. But I hesitate sometimes to share things because it's just amazing to me what God can do. Last year was one of the most challenging years of our life and our family, things that we've gone through. But in the middle of all of that, explosions of God's grace, blessing. We had a man who started watching on television, or actually not even on TV. He started watching on the internet. Businessman. You thought I was joking. A businessman. Listen to this, Dave. A businessman. Never seen me, never heard of me, never heard me preach from a different denomination, never saw me on TV, never heard me at a conference, never read a book, nothing. 
he watched one Sunday and he and his wife when they watched that one Sunday kept watching and in a period of about 14 months that man has given over 11 million dollars to help us preach the gospel God had blessed our ministry and we, we were a debt free ministry and he heard we wanted a building and we found a building in downtown Atlanta theater beautiful midtown incredible and it was going to cost uh, about five million dollars and some change that didn't include the renovations and stuff had the parking and everything perfect he heard that and said I want to challenge your church I'm somebody who's never been to your church but I watch online from the great state of somewhere because I ain't going to tell none of you you'll try to find me <laughs> that's funny <laughs> I've been in this too long, hadn't I? It's just, it's just been in it too long. Uh, um, what was I talking about? Challenged me. And he said, I'll give a matching gift of $4 million if your church will match it. And then he made a stipulation. This was a stipulation that it has to be above your regular tithes and offerings of the year before. Therefore, if you don't mind, he didn't ask for this, but I told him, I said, I, said, I accept the challenge. He, he said, I was wondering when I would ever find a ministry that would have vision enough to accommodate my resources. Are there, are there people sitting out there who are waiting on... Deep calls the deep. You, you can't have a little vision and call for the deep resources and then you get a big... No, no, no. You get the vision and deep calls to deep resources into that vision if God gave you that vision. And Tony, I'm not... I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it. I got up and told our church exactly what I'm telling you. And a miracle happened and within three months above it was and the year before was a record year above what we had given during that period of about eight weeks a little over eight weeks the people gave above and beyond willingly offered themselves and we matched that had the eight million to do everything that we wanted to do debt free I'm trying to increase somebody's faith tonight. I'm trying to tell you that the money is there, the people are there, the help is there. God has it all. He's not just wanting us to bump along and, and get along here. And I know, I know it's a hard time to pastor right now, but at the same time, it's the most exciting time I have ever seen in my life. And we watched last year, and what I'm telling you, I'm not ashamed to tell you, because we put it on the internet. You can, you, we're a member of the Evangelical Council of Financial Accountability. You can go on and look at what we do. See what we take and see what we spend and see where it goes. And the year before last, we, we were at about $52 million for the year that God had helped us. We have to have it to do what we do. But last year, we saw our resources go to $77 million. The leap that took place was miraculous and supernatural. And it's not about the money. It's about who 
will get in. I'm trying to tell you money is not a shortage. When you get in the battle and you do what God tells you to do, and really you don't even worry about it. You don't have to think about it. You just do what God told you to do. And he said, I'll make a way. And I'll have people that you don't even know I have been. They, that man told me, me and my wife watched you for almost six months before we ever decided to do anything. We watched you. You don't, somebody is always watching you that's capable of blessing you enormously. Wow, I don't know where this sermon's going. I didn't mean to go this way, but somebody needs to stand up on your feet and say, God, enlarge my vision. I want to be in the battle. I want my church in the battle. I want my ministry in the battle. I'm not retired. I am still willingly offering myself not for anything. See, I think as you get older, your motive gets purer. I really do. Because there was a time when I was very ambitious about ministry. And sometimes it's a fine line between vision and ambition. It really is. And God needs some go-getters. God needs some people who, who, who are edgy. God needs some people who are entrepreneurs spiritually for the kingdom of God. But the older you get, I'm 59 now. I don't care. I don't care about trying to impress nobody with nothing. I really don't. I've hurt too much, cried too much. And even though it's humble, Lord help my will, though the cost be great, I understand that part of it that people don't understand, that the, the, the stuff that comes with it. But boy, I think the longer you go, the more you trust God this is true with your businesses too. It's just like the blessings start overtaking you. And then you get so serious about what can I do with what I've been given that will truly, truly, truly please God and make a difference.